Before we start, I just want to set down some ground rules. We are recording the session for the purpose of documentation. We are between all of us, we are comfortable in Hindi and English. So if you would like to ask a question in Hindi, that's fine too. Please use the Q&A box for your questions in the chat box, for your comments. It'd be great if you can introduce yourself when you add in a question. Um, there are Twitter details if you'd like to tweet about the session. And finally, and probably most importantly, I wanted to say that uh, this is obviously a really hard time. We were just chatting about this. And it is not just hard in all the news that's coming our way. It's an emotional time for many of us with loved ones. Um, having to kind of go through what the pandemic is doing at us. So I would request everybody who's here to be cognizant of that and be really thankful to our speakers who are here with us today. So I just request everyone to be thoughtful in the comments and the questions that you raise um, and to engage with the session with kindness and patience. Um, so on that note, I'd like to quickly give you a brief overview. Many of you know about Cornet. It is a research network and a community of practice that we've had uh, for about a year now with about 50 plus research organizations to mark about a year of this network coming together. We decided to organize this conference to really bring together learnings from the network when we initially planned it. It was called Learnings for Resilience and Resurgence. It seems inappropriate now, but at the same time, we also felt that the conversations that we're having around topics like the one we will have today are really important to keep in mind and to engage with deeply even during this time, um, not just for the immediate future, but to think about the longer term impacts that all of this is going to have on systems in India. So I would like to start by introducing our moderator for today, Aparajita. Dr. Aparajita Gogoi is the Executive Director of C3, Center for Catalyzing Change, which is dedicated to empowering girls and women in India. She's also the National Coordinator of the White Ribbon Alliance for Safe Motherhood India, where she leads advocacy activities for safe motherhood. Um, not more to say about Aprajita, but I will hand it over to her. Uh, thank you, Babita, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at this uh, particular time. I echo what Babita said. Um, we know that our country is going through, I think, the worst uh, imaginable crisis. And uh, what is on top of it is my mind is that we don't know when this particular wave will end. But we all know that the second wave is much more uh, devastating than the first wave. Uh, but like people say, uh, we have to uh, you know, keep going. We have to look at uh, the impact of such crisis, uh, what can be done and what needs to be done. Uh, we need recommendations. We need to look at learnings. And that's why appropriately at this particular panel, we'll be talking about, you know, uh, if we, now we know there was the first wave. So we will talk about the impact of COVID-19, uh, the lockdown, the unlock uh, around this time last year, extending to the end of the year. Uh, you know, what was really the impact of all of this on essential family planning, reproductive health and abortion services? Our panelists whom I will introduce very soon, uh, will offer us insights on you know, the changing uh, demand, uh, demand patterns, uh, what was happening at the supply side. And we hope that we will learn uh, from what has happened in order to move forward and address system level gaps and also recommend policy level actions uh, that we need to look at in order to ensure the continuity of essential SRH services you know, as essential uh, and integral part of the system level pandemic response and recovery. You know, it's ironic that we, we thought that we were in the, on the path to recovery and today we have gone back to literally the starting point and, and you know, it's actually worse than you know, the one year back. So on that sobering, uh, kind of sobering note, uh, I would like to introduce our panelists to you all today. Uh, we have uh, Pranita Achut from ICRW. She is a member of both the global and Asia senior management teams at ICRW, and she plays a key role in the institutional strategic planning and decision making. Uh, so welcome, Pranita. Our uh, second panelist is uh, Priti Priti Anand. She leads the family planning program of uh, the Uttar Pradesh Technical Support uh, Unit. Uh, she provides technical assistance to the government of Uttar Pradesh to improve uh, access and quality of family planning services. And uh, then we have Sushanta Banerjee. Uh, Dr. Banerjee leads the research and evaluation team at IPAC Development Foundation, IDF. And uh, Sushanta is responsible for providing technical guidance and overseeing the implementation of monitoring and evaluation efforts. And then we have uh, Mr. Todd, Todd Callahan, who is the executive director of DKT India. DKT is a social marketing organization that promotes, distributes, and sells contraceptives and safe abortion products across the uh, I'd like to again echo Babita's words that we have uh, people here today with us on the panel who has seen the impact, who has studied the impact, who has researched the impact uh, that we have seen on SRH, FP, and safe abortion services. And I feel that because of where we are standing today, what we will learn from them today is really going to help us in moving forward. So with this, I would like to really invite uh, Pranita to set the context for the panel. Um, also, uh, Babita had talked about the ground rules, but I want to uh, ask you to look at the chat window. You will see the ground rules there. And Pranita, now if I can uh, move to you, hand it over to you uh, and invite you to you know, really set the context for the panel for the rest of our speakers. If you could highlight some of the key issues and that emerged uh, you know, and, and that led to reduce access and availability and uh, where, uh, you know, what kind of compromises did you see uh, when it came to service provision and access? So over to you, Pranita. Thank you. Thank you, Aprajita. Good evening, everyone. And I hope that you all are doing well. Uh, so as Aprajita mentioned, today I'll be sharing some evidence on impact of COVID crisis on demand and supply of FP and abortion services. And uh, these studies are uh, like are conducted by uh, various coordinate members and other researchers. So it's not just about from ICRW, but uh, a range of research, uh, research work that different researchers have done. Uh, moving uh, to the next slide. So uh, most of you may, must have remembered that, that in May, FRHS uh, India provided an early estimate on impact of COVID and related containment efforts on availability and access of family planning and abortion services. 
under the most likely scenario of services resuming with full capacity by September 2020, estimates were that 25.6 million couples will be unable to access modern contraceptive, 2.37 million unintended pregnancies will be there, and 1.44 million abortions with over 800,000 unsafe. I mean, just now we, we talked, um, September 2020 was peak of first wave with over 90,000 cases, uh, COVID cases a day. So we, we can revisit and rethink what this early prediction, I mean, though early predictions were very crucial for us to really see what we are, we are, we are going to face in future. But now that we are looking at it retrospectively, probably we may have uh, seen much bigger implication than probably what we had imagined in the, uh, in the earlier months. Just like, you know, the initial predictions were also supported by uh, studies which were conducted by Population Council with UNICEF and other partners. And what we saw that while demand increased among young women, uh, use actually declined. And uh, uh, among 18 to 24 years, currently married women, only 14% reported using any modern uh, method. Now, it's strictly, it's not really comparable. What we saw that is actually indicates a, a declining pattern when compared to the study that was conducted uh, between October and February 2020 in UP. So even if we don't really take these uh, figures on the face value, there were some indication that use is, is declining. And even like, you know, this, this, uh, the study that was done in, in, in June, um, May, June, we saw that those who were not using a modern contraceptive, around 11% expressed the need for modern method and additional 19% reported that they were not able to access so family planning services because of the lockdown. If we look at the trajectory of FP services and where the disruption and resumption, you all may remember that you know, uh, on March 20, uh, 25, we all enter like the state uh, country entered in a nationwide lockdown with a lot of chaos and confusion. There wasn't any enough clarity whether FP is part of the non-COVID essential services or not. But 20 days later, uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare issued circular adding family planning on the list of non-COVID essential services with only non-clinical service to be provided. By first week of May, we then we saw that issues were uh, uh, circulated on uh, resumption of village health and nutrition day services. And then we entered uh, a phase of unlocking and relaxation. By July 1st, all services, clinical and non-clinical, more or less resumed. And I'm talking more uh, from the context of UP and Bihar, where we have been um, working uh, closely. And, and if we really look at what is happening on the ground, uh, if we move to the next slide, we saw that there's been lag between resumption and access to services. And this is here, I've taken evidence from Bihar, experiences from Bihar. A study conducted in Bihar in July 2020 showed that spacing methods were available in all the facilities, but that was not true for the permanent method sterilization services. Only half of the facilities had initiated uh, those services. As OPDs were closed, FP services were available as emergency services. Three fourths of the providers shared uh, several concerns limiting service or, or limiting their capability to deliver services, including shortage of health staff with increased workload, with COVID taking bulk of their physical and mental space, follow-up services were irregular. There was also decrease of footfall of FP clients out of fear uh, of infection. And whoever were coming to facility to access services, there was more demand for condom compared to any other services. Continuing on the, on the supply side, uh, true to their name, FLWs, emerged as a crucial link between people and health system 
undertaking range of roles and responsibilities during COVID outbreak and lockdown. During the initial uh, period, FLWs largely focused on COVID-related activities, doing household screening, providing information. But as the RMNCH services resumed, including routine uh, immunization in later months, their work increased substantially with little support or training. With disruption of non-COVID health care services delivery at facility, a lot of burdens shifted on FLWs to provide FP commodities and services. So one was that facilities were not able to provide services and even the supply chain was not really smooth and adequate. And, and when I talk about supply chain, I mean, it is about the FP commodities, but even the other essential goods, including PP kit or other supplies were not really available uh, uh, to FLWs. In one of the studies, 24% of ANMs reported having Re, uh, regular uh, PPE kit. Like in a way, almost 76% didn't have regular PPE kit uh, available with them, despite being on the forefront. There were also reports of FLWs facing severe backlash from the community members, particularly in the initial months when they were called Corona Didi or like perceived more as a carrier of virus. Even migrant men particularly avoided ASHAs due to fear of quarantine. So we, we saw that how like, you know, their vulnerabilities have really increased in that, uh, in, in terms of delivering the services. We also uh, saw there were like, you know, unsystematic and ad hoc instructions and guidelines being uh, passed on to FLWs. But we also witnessed that things improved over time with districts conducting conducting video conferencing and online trainings for frontline workers. FLWs across uh, uh, various studies reported feeling overwhelmed, exhausted and distressed with increasing workload of COVID and non-COVID related tasks. And not only that, but the increased care responsibility at home really ma made their situation much more precarious. In one of the studies, 59% uh, of ANMs reported higher stress level than normal. So, I mean, we, we can really see how the COVID situation had really increased vulnerabilities for FLW, for sure for other, all the sets of providers, but it seemed that FLW become much even more vulnerable given the context and the position in the health system that they are in. Moving next, COVID crisis, one side we saw how the supply side really got affected. COVID crisis also affected household and couple dynamics. Several studies have highlighted the financial crisis people went through. Women and men were struggling to secure livelihood with few options. A qualitative study uh, that ICRW conducted in UP and Bihar pointed towards heightened notion of masculinity with uncertainty, fear with pressure to provide for family, men looked for opportunities to uh, assert themselves. Despite uh, spending extended time at home, uh, they, their engagement in household work was fairly minimal. There were also reports of incidents of domestic violence. You know, the interesting was that yet, when we were talking uh, to key, uh, key informants, people were more considerate towards men comfortable with their recognition of challenges, stress men were facing without really recognizing the situation women were in. So that, that was uh, in a way affecting the household and spousal dynamics. D during the initial days of lockdown, there was also some sort of fear of infection, uh, which really um, made people, couples refrain from sexual activities, but gradually as more information was available, myths were cleared, people engage in the, their regular sexual activities. But the interesting was that um, men and women had different expressions and engagement on, on sex. Uh, men describe sex as a, a release from psychological distress, a distraction from the crisis and fear. Um, it was also means uh, to assert themselves. Migrant and newlywed men talked about difficulties of uh, keeping distance or, or abstin uh, maintaining abstinence 
while being within the same physical space with spouse but for many women it was pressure and desirable demand for sex women expressed uh, their frustration dealing with increased demand as they were not able to really negotiate and in, in this time pharmacists and rmps really emerged as as uh, important cr crucial go to people despite at times providing inaccurate and inconsistent information and even uh, a woman were approaching pharmacist many women also opted for different traditional uh, methods uh, during that time covid deepened pre existing inequalities marginalized were further marginalized unmet need for contraceptive was higher among women from socially disadvantaged caste and tribes um even uh, like the areas which were perceived to be at higher risk of uh, infection access to services was uh, lower uh, there then further the this high uh, male migrants returning i mean there there are studies which have shown uh, that how high male out migration areas are much lesser prepared in terms of contraceptive uh, availability and access and probably that also contributed when large number of ma uh, men returned home during initial time of lockdown situation of abortion services was not very different from this uh, according to an estimate from ipas almost 1.85 million women would not have accessed abortion services as near term impact of covid and will hear, hear much more from uh, another colleague from ipas um reduced access to contraceptive return of migrants increased demand for sex domestic violence these are all factors which must have contributed enormously to unplanned pregnancy however lack of clarity about abortion as an essential service in initial days restricted availability of services even when telemedicine practice guide uh, practice guide uh, guidelines were introduced safe abortion service uh, services were not specifically identified as approved services supply chain was previously also struggling even before the lockdown was started there was short supply of raw material for production of me pills so limited availability coupled with restricted mobility uh, presence of family members at home increased burden of care work had really adversely affected women's access to abortion services and and we really uh, saw from studies that uh, that uh, were done uh, during this time we move further uh, in fact very interestingly uh, i pass identified five pathways women may follow when faced with restricted access to abortion services with huge implication for individual households and health system so one is about that they may delay access uh, access may delay the access but then finally get the services from their preferred point of care the another is that they are able to access but not at their initial uh, preference point uh, be like you know be it point of care or the methods that they wanted and in fact uh, another study from ipas actually showed that almost 83% um, of women may not have been able to access services from their point of preference there is also likelihood of increased requirement for second uh, trimester abortion some may have continued with unintended pregnancy while some other may have restored to unsafe abortion and all these have a huge implication as i said for individual for household but also for health system providing a second trimester surgical abortion has has a lot of um, cost and and resource uh, implication at the end i just want to bring uh, out few key takeaways which has implications for our current context and as everybody said we are in the middle of second wave which is much bigger much uh, much difficult uh, compared to probably what we saw earlier so like the first thing i i want to say that the initial confusion on the srh being essential services had prolonged consequences with restricted availability and access and i hope that some of those initial learnings must have been taken care of. i mean that's also we need to really see 
how much we have learned from there. High unmet need for FP and abortion coupled with restricted access is likely to result in unplanned. I mean, we all really understand. What is really important is that how we recognize that SRH services are essential and operationalize those uh, on the ground. There are uneven power dynamics in spousal relationship, which are getting exacerbated during the crisis, which need to be really recognized in policy and programming. There are opportunities in terms of young people's aspiration. There are opportunities uh, of um, acceptance and increased access to technology, which need to be really leveraged on. It's extremely crucial that we recognize FLW's risk and vulnerabilities and we address uh, for them to really perform their uh, role and responsibilities. I just want to last uh, a second, I want to take and say that most of these studies were done in the initial uh, months of the lockdown. We really need to continue keep building uh, these crucial evidences to really see that what we have learned, what we have done, and how this second phase is really impacting, which is much bigger and much, much uh, uh, difficult for all of us. With that, I just stop. Thank you all and over to you, Prajika. Thank you, Pranita, for laying out the context. I think it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, not just the data, even our work itself is really telling us how the high unmet need for FP, for abortion services, uh, you know, added with the restricted access is likely to result in, you know, many more unplanned pregnancy, answer for abortions and untimed births. Um, and I think uh, given the situation we are in today, it's really, really important that we look at how we can either ensure undisturbed access or a quick resumption, because Pranita, you did talk about the slow resumption uh, of services uh, when the unlock phase happened. And it would, it would be really great to hear our panelists also talk about, you know, the recommendations uh, that they may have. Just before I logged on for this call, uh, I was part of a WhatsApp group where the whole conversation was people looking for a hospital which was willing to deliver uh, COVID positive pregnant women. Uh, even in larger cities, doctors are, you know, hospitals are already refusing to take in uh, women who are uh, COVID positive. So I think there is, there is, there is in a way a sense of uh, deja vu in a way that, you know, we, we are kind of hearing the same kind of problems again now. And I think from your presentation, you know, there are some facts which I really want to highlight is, for example, you talked about young couples uh, who anyway had challenges in accessing not just services, but also information around family planning SRH and how a kind of COVID, uh, you know, took the challenges to a greater level. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, this whole uh, connecting health to, you know, the other things that's happening in our life, the loss of livelihood and what it did to FPSRH, safe motherhood, etc. Uh, you know, this not many people want to talk about how the lockdown led to increased domestic violence and not just increased in domestic violence, but also restricted uh, access uh, for women to seek out and, and take health. Uh, a lot of us have been talking about how a lockdown and this whole gender division of household labor, labor, how not just the burden of care, but the burden of work also uh, fell on, on, on women. And lastly, I really want to uh, thank you for pointing out the stress that our health workers went through and are still going through, whether it was working long hours, being at the front line, you know, noting down immigrants coming back, who's in a containment area, who's not. Uh, and, you know, this whole, not just their own fear of infection, but also the the backlash uh, that they face from their own communities. And from our work in Bihar, uh, we really wanted, you know, kind of to talk about solutions. In Bihar, when we engaged with Panchayatiraj representatives to really help the health workers do their work, it really yielded good results. So that is one of the solutions that maybe later again uh, we can talk about. So thank you, Pranita. And now I'm going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Sushanto. And Sushanto, if we could ask you to share some insights from your work on COVID-19's impact on the changing demand patterns uh, among women who uh, who need to access safe abortion uh, services. 
um, you know, how the services were compromised, to what extent, how quickly were they restored, and very, very importantly, what would be your recommendations for system level adjustments that we need to incorporate to address uh, similar challenges uh, in the future. So over to you, uh, Sushanto. Thank you, Aprajita. Uh, thank you, Pranita, for setting the context. And you know, the right story, what Aparajita just now has shared, 2020 April, we started getting call from field that Rukmini, I changed the name, is actually running from one pillar to other post and she is looking for abortion services. And it is a complete denial, denial after denial. She has been finally admitted in a private nursing home. And then after two days, they also denied services. And Rukmini was continuing her unintended pregnancy. And that was really our starting point to understand what really is happening in the reality through evidences. We started our you know, collection of evidence in three phases. Therefore, first you can understand what we have done is actually we tried you know, to do a modeling to understand the compromise on abortions and that we finished by July, 2020. Therefore, you can understand we tried to capture the immediate impact of uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. The next, you know, when this is released and you know, circulated throughout the globe, many places of the you know, countries, different countries started understanding and asking me the question whether health facility is ready to really cope up with the situation. Therefore, in the second you know, uh, you know, activity, we tried to assess the health facility and their preparedness that where we are. And finally, in the third phase of evidence collection, we reached to the community. It was very sequential and systematic so that we can get a 360 degree picture. And frankly speaking, we never expected that the second phase will come back again like this. And probably that's why what the last line Pranita has said we again need to start from the scratch of the phase two. Next slide, please. If you see that modeling, what really I got at the, you know, at the, at the beginning, that just at the time of lockdown, there was 59% of abortion compromised, women didn't get services. And then over a period of time, it came down to 33%. And I was very, very optimistic, frankly speaking, statistically, it was coming that finally it will go to 10% uh, or 15% loss. And that is kind of manageable, but reality probably was not in favor of our context. After this loss, you know, we tried to see what is happening at the facility level. And we are fortunate enough because we have huge number of intervention facilities who are regularly providing abortion and family planning services. We reached to 1,784 who were regularly providing abortion services in 10 major states of India. And you know, this is a good mix of public health, uh, you know, primary health center, community health center, and sub-district, district hospitals and medical colleges. What we get from this facility assessment, you can see in the next slide, that very interesting, 30% of these regularly providing facilities, they were not providing any abortion services. And those who were providing abortion services, they are mostly located at the urban area and mostly they were providing fast trimester abortion. The basic reasons when we slice out from these 2000 facilities, they stopped due to COVID and not started yet. No train provider, because all train provider now assigned for COVID duty, and we are not able to manage both sides. Few facilities very strongly told that we are ready, we can provide somehow, but women are scared to visit facility and even don't know 
that we have started providing abortion services. And from the other side, majority of the facilities reported, we are having tremendous crisis of PPE kit and testing facility. Without testing facility, we do not want to you know, touch a patient and we want ourselves to keep you know, safe for the safety of this community because it is a long-term goal. And that was the crisis at the facility level, but 70% who were ready and they were ready to provide services, many of them are not getting women coming for abortion services because of the absolute uniform fear and scare. Then in the month of December, we reached to the community, you know, three states to understand the barriers of young women in the context of SRH. But today I will be presenting only abortion services, but you can see that report, it is very interesting. You can see that all gamut of SRH services, how that has been impacted by this COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, you can see that, you know, it was 900 young women sample, face-to-face uh, -face interview, first time we got this clearance. And, uh, you know, mostly they were from the vulnerable community, uh, you know, below the poverty line, a, a good segment, almost 47% were below the poverty line. And what actually we got from them as, as outcome of abortion services, you can see that in the, in the next slide, um, you know, very interesting that almost, you know, uh, can you please uh, switch the slide and you can see that before you go to the SRH services that which actually impacted is not the health domain, it is the other domain. It is almost very similar to Pranita. 71% were having financial difficulties. 60% reported increased domestic violence. 64% reported restricted mobility. 62% reported fear of visiting health facility. I think these four domains actually dictated the access to SRH services, what you can see in the next slide. 25% young women reported they were not able to access abortion services when the situation was much normal. And in the month of November and December, we were started thinking we are escaped from this virus and we are actually in a very good situation. We are winning the game and they forced to continue unwanted pregnancy. When you see that, you know, the reasons they have given they said that, you know, I you know, wanted abortion, but husband didn't allow me to go out because of this COVID pandemic. Didn't have money to bear for the cost of abortion because few private facilities were providing services and I didn't have that kind of money that I can afford during pandemic. They visited health facility for abortion, uh, you know, with great difficulty. Somebody, you know, hired transport and taxis, but it was denied, it was closed and wanted abortion, but I was afraid of getting infection, so didn't go to the facility. And that was the hardcore reality. 83% among who actually got abortion services reported that uh, we accessed abortion from the point of care. That was not our preferred choice. Therefore, we just compromised our choice. And the other kind of barriers actually what they have posted is that reduced social support for this cause, disrupted information. There was really no information where to go, economic challenges, mobility restriction, fear of controlling infection and compromised agency. Because of domestic violence and new family dynamics, their agency has been compromised grossly. Now, what really system level adjustment we need to do from all these findings is that you know community support and linkage we need to really think of for our future support within the community it is not really community support per se that means you know everything should come from the community because pandemic may come or this kind of crisis may come in future and that is evident what the need they need information this report, you will get very interesting thing. Those who are having information, they are having access. Second component is supply and human resource. Le there was huge shortage of PPE kit, MA drugs and contraception shortage and, you know, trained provider. Because of lack of trained provider, 
who were you know having access at the urban facilities rural community are not going there Whereas rural community, they are having one doctor who knows, you know, uh, who is trained for giving abortion services and managing the other, other hundred things. Therefore, it's a huge crisis for the trained provider. And finally, we need a system, a balanced approach, an alternative mechanism. We need to really think out of box how we can support community within the community. It may be telemedicine. It may be other approach, but we need to break the wall. And we need a balance between COVID versus non-COVID parameter. What is really happening when COVID is getting so much of hue and cry, the non-COVIDs are almost neglected in our world. Thank you very much. And at the end, I would say that abortion tells us something, you know, uh, fundamental about uh, this, you know, broader ecosystem for sexual and reproductive health that people live in. By making the abortion ecosystem sustainable, we can improve the foundation on which other rights and freedom can be realized and sustained. Thank you very much, all panel members and you know all persons who are actually anxiously waiting for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shushanto. Um, also, I want to thank the people who are uh, typing the questions. Uh, please uh, keep typing your questions. We'll take it up after we have finished one round of conversation with all our all our panelists. Um, so Sushanto, again, uh, thank you for really sharing some of those uh, sobering details about the barriers that women faced uh, when uh, while seeking a safe abortion services, whether it was just plain and simple disruption in service delivery, it was the fear of infection or the restricted mobility. But also this very important point that, uh, you know, we cannot look at health services separated from what's happening in the lives of people, whether it is the loss of livelihood, the financial causes, the mobility, the violence that, that women and girls face. And also the fact that women and girls just did not have the agency to make decisions or, or negotiate for their health. Um, so thank you so much. And again, also for calling out, you know, Sushanto, the need for a, a very kind of a strong community support, which we need to empower women and girls to access the information that they require to access the products and, and services. And you talked about a balanced approach. So we're now going to move the conversation. Uh, also uh, to the supply side now and you know talk a bit about the disruptions that we faced in the supply chain and distribution of drugs of you know contraceptive abortion pills during uh, 2020 and its impact on the lives of millions of women and young people so i'd like to invite todd who's from uh, dkt a leading social marketing organization uh, who works on the supply side to talk of the challenges uh, both in manufacturing and distribution uh, that has impacted us uh, globally and also in India. And Todd, if you could also kind of you know point us to the paths to recovery. How do we sustain some of this? How do we sustain markets? How do we really build on opportunities uh, that could be there to expand services? How do we incorporate you know, innovative solutions uh, in our work. So over to you, Todd. Uh, thank you, uh, Aparjita. Uh, on behalf of DKT India, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, tonight. Um, in my remarks, um, I plan to comment on DKT India's private sector experience of the past year. Uh, in the interest of time, I will make brief remarks about the following areas. Demand side challenges, supply side challenges, shipping and logistics problems, human resource issues, and finally, shifts in consumer behavior. The first big point I wanna make is that demand for family planning products and services uh, has definitely changed as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. I, I don't wanna cover um, um, some of the ground that uh, the, the two prior uh, panelists have covered, but uh, definitely we see a big change in, in demand. For example, uh, demand has fallen in many markets for condoms due to clubs, uh, nightclubs, uh, uh, um, you know, red light areas and other entertainment centers uh, being closed or restricted. Uh, Durex, for instance, has reported on this in their business. Some of the world's largest condom manufacturers in Southeast Asia have, have shared similar anecdotes. 
In our own business in India, we also saw a decline in condom ordering in the March through June period before a recovery in the second half of the year. More generally on the demand side, we saw a sharp decline in demand for products and services provided by doctors last year. For example, due to doctors' fears of, of exposure and movement of people restrictions, we witnessed a significant drop in sales of IUDs, three-month injectables, and surgical abortion kits. Um, overall, I would characterize the decline in demand as most affecting doctor-driven products and services. Our over-the-counter business, in comparison, remained pretty strong because chemist shops, by and large, remained open. On the supply side, there, there were a fire hose of problems during the first two to three months after the national lockdown occurred. On a positive note, I believe fears about API shortages were overstated and overblown. From DKT's experience, we did not face any supply problems because our manufacturing partners could not import hormonal inputs from China or Europe. On the negative side, a few of our important manufacturing partners are based in Greater Mumbai and Maharashtra, which is where the largest COVID-19 outbreaks first occurred. For instance, condoms and IUDs come from Maharashtra manufacturers. In a lot of cases, order fulfillment was slower because our partners could not get local permission to reopen or hire the day laborers that they needed to dispatch orders. In DKT's own case, we have a large depot just outside of Mumbai that was closed for a while. We ship orders from, from this depot to distributors nationwide. We also operate our doctor store e-commerce site fulfillment center from this depot. In the final analysis, we had to involve our law firm and the warehouse operator in negotiations with the local police so that we could reopen the operation. One interesting anecdote that I wanna share with everyone is that we were really lucky that our depot owner was also involved in shipping out consignments of insulin. Uh, this helped him secure quicker understanding from the local police about the importance of reopening the warehouse. Although it, it is a supply side issue, I thought it might be useful to highlight how shipping and logistics problems also impeded access to family planning products. In India, I think it's fair to say that state and local governments have an incredible amount of autonomy, just like the United States. The regional autonomy, this regional autonomy comes with pros and cons. One of the things that we experienced at DKT was enormous confusion at the state and local level. From our perspective, the guidance and directives coming out of the Home Affairs Ministry were pretty good. However, we found ourselves negotiating again and again and again with local governments and police who were either unaware of the Home Affairs Ministry directives or who interpreted them in very restrictive ways. In the end, we were able to negotiate and manage our way through these problems, but it was exhausting. And in some cases, it slowed down the, the flow of orders to our distributors and other customers. Moving on, human resources issues are the next topic I wanna to touch on. Just after the national lockdown was announced last March, there was enormous fear and anxiety in our field force about COVID-19. For instance, initially there was a real reluctance for our medical representatives to leave their, to leave their homes to visit doctors, clinics, and chemist shops. In a lot of cases, doctors and clinics also did not want to meet with our sales representatives. Because it took a while for the fear to subside, initially, our representatives employed a combination of in-person visits and follow-up via phone, WhatsApp, email, and other means to reach out to these customers. Over the last year, I also want to underline the stress that our organization and others have been through with respect to employees falling sick with COVID-19. While there have been dozens of employee infections over the last 13 months at DKT India, I'm relieved to share with all of you that there have that that all have recovered, except sadly uh, for one individual. Finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about the shift in consumer behavior. Uh, again, some of some of this has already been mentioned by the the previous panelists. 
What I would say is in terms of broad strokes, we have seen a decline in our clinical business because the public has not had the same access to doctors that they had before the COVID-19 crisis erupted. This means a decline in long-term contraceptive methods such as sterilization, IUDs, three-month injectables, and doctor-supervised surgical abortions. On a more positive note, we have seen strong double-digit growth in our over-the-counter business that moves through chemist shops and other retailers. For instance, OCPs and condom sales in the second half of last year were way, way up. I mean, almost 20% up. This makes sense because access to products from chemist shops has been pretty good. Uh, thank you. That's it for me. Um, if, uh, if there are any follow-up questions or comments, I'm, I'm uh, quite happy to take them. Thank you, Todd, for that and uh, very crisply covering you know, what happened around the supply chain issues uh, and the fact that the logistical challenges were really more than the manufacturing challenges. And this very, very important point that you know, the need for convergent understanding and convergent implementation, you talked about how many of the logistic challenges were faced because of the other departments hindering the distribution chain. And also the fact that, you know, I think this is for all of us to uh, really figure out how uh, do we uh, ensure that when something is listed as essential, it is treated as essential. I think sometimes, you know, you know, SRH FP may be listed as essential, but nobody seemed to be really focused on it. It's just there in the guideline. And uh, Todd, you also referred to the fact that, you know, when the first wave hit, the lockdown happened, the unlock phases took place. And we saw from Pranita's uh, timeline laying out also uh, that we did uh, witness uh, very positive guidelines and circulars uh, that, that, you know, that were sent out by different uh, government uh, departments. And I think India was one of the first countries to actually list uh, RH, reproductive health, maternal health services as essential services. However, for those of, her who, or those of us who work in the state, we also saw a varying levels of responses by various uh, state to COVID-19 guidelines, resumption of services. Uh, you know, there were communication issues. And there were a lot of uh, misinformation among the private providers about what, to con what services to continue, what not to do. Um, but there were also positive uh, steps, like for example, the Government of India initiative to uh, really ramp up and encourage telemedicine to be part of services. Um, so kind of carrying on from here, now I'd like to invite Priti Anand from uh, UPTSU to talk about you know, how UP managed uh, the restoration of FPSRH services and, and abortion services in the, uh, in the public sector. And Priti, it'll be very good if you can also tell us about you know, where there are any convergent actions uh, which took place among various uh, departments, for example, sure. health and PRI, et cetera, and how the collective response from various stakeholders, including NGOs and CSOs, help. Uh, so over to you, Priti. Thanks, Aprajita. And uh, I think what happened last April, uh, similar to what happened in all the other states, I think we were uh, in UP as ill-prepared uh, or as not well-prepared uh, because this was something new. Um, I think most of us had never faced a pandemic uh, situation in our lives, whether in the public sector or the private sector. And so uh, when the lockdown uh, was announced in March and continued in April, I think the entire energies of the government of Uttar Pradesh uh, started getting aligned towards how do you handle uh, the COVID situation, what does it mean, what implications, how do you provision for services, uh, what should be the training proto protocols, what should be the testing protocols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, in April, uh, while the entire government machinery came around uh, to uh, you know, prepare for facing the pandemic, uh, a virus unknown to, not knowing the repercussions, not knowing what scale it would go to, we saw like what happened in all the other states, a complete uh, turning away in a way from the other uh, essential services, including family planning, reproductive, maternal, child health, all the other services. Uh, so April, of course, uh, uh, as, as the technical unit that works with the government, we did 
support the government in you know developing the training protocols rolling out really large numbers of trainings for doctors nurses paramedics frontline workers etc so that everybody was aware what we were dealing with uh, based on whatever information was available and how do we deal with it at our public sector facilities end of april we began getting calls from the rmncha counselors based at uh, the public facilities saying that women had started calling in asking that what happens to their next doses of anthra anthra is the injectable contraceptive and that's when it hit that while we are going to be working on dealing uh, with covid we cannot in any which way ignore or put aside all the other services for which uh, you know we we as a public uh, as a support unit and the government would need to be prepared and what we realized uh, while we were preparing at a large scale uh, when i say we i'm I, i'm saying uh, on behalf of the government we realized that there was also a lot of uncertainty and misinformation that all facilities would now only do covid services uh, no clarity that went out on uh, you know what would happen to other services and interestingly even though there was not a single order by the government which said that family planning or maternal and other child health services would have to be shut down or will be uh, you know put on hold there was no such order in up it was automatically presumed by the public sector facilities the doctors and the nurses that the only thing they would be dealing with would be the covid situation and that's when our first set of uh, interactions with the government in end of april uh, clearly highlighted and the government responded to it where a set of government orders were issued starting april where it began from the resumption of vhnd services with uh, immunization and family planning being really critical parts of the services to be provisioned to fp getting included in the set of essential services to be offered by the facilities starting with just focusing on abortion care and uh, uh sterilization services and then the next order going out uh, around early june saying that opd resumes and all the spacing methods have to be provisioned for in fp so while the government was completely dealing with this entirely new situation in covid complete credit to them that they responded uh to all the needs that were emerging and were able to send out the right orders of course uh, when it came to including sterilization and abortion services in the essential package we had to reach out to the government of india saying that an order from you know a letter from you if comes into the states the states would respond faster the government of india responded to that and pranita had already showed in her timelines how uh, things had uh, moved within a time span and then came july which is also the time when uh, the world population uh, fortnight is celebrated looking at that opportunity to be encashed completely uh, we worked very closely with the government to build back that assurance about services of uh, the fpr srh services back at the facilities use those 15 20 days to really build that environment and get uh, try and get the services back on track another thing we realized that while the government was of course dealing with the covid uh, situation uh, it was automatically presumed that all the facilities in the state would be covid facilities which was again reworked and therefore only one ward in the district hospital and one uh, chc initially were assigned as covid facilities and therefore information was again circulated saying that these are the only designated covid facilities which will not provide for the entire set of rm and chs services and will only deal with covid uh, patients however the rest of the chcs in the districts and the rest of the district hospital uh, parts will continue to provision for the rm and chs services and people can get there get their desired services etc and therefore with these initial orders going out what really worked was that up did not see a drastic dip in institutional de deliveries even during the covid times and 
as we began working and continued to work with uh, the public health uh, sec sector and the system and the doctors and you know the officials at the state and the district level we realized a few things which were really really positive one was that the need for fp services remained to be really strong and there were clients who were reaching out to the frontline workers and to the rm and cha counselors and asking for, okay, where do I get my next set of pills? People returned to the facilities as soon as assurance of services was given. So starting, I mean, I, I will show you the next few slides. Starting June, July, we saw the services picking up again. Once people were assured that, okay, the facility, no, please go back to the previous slide, uh, that, that the facility that I would choose to go to get a service, a public sector facility is not a designated COVID facility. And so I do not have to be worried about also COVID patients being there. Uh, on the behavior side, the providers, we realized as soon as we began interacting with them, holding sessions with them, getting them to connect on you know, the Zoom platform, et cetera, that they were open to offering services when we nudged them a little. And the client supported to opt for the easily available methods, even though uh, those methods may not have been their first choice. So that was a message we very clearly sent out to the frontline workers that counsel the clients when you're meeting them, because as we know, the FLWs continue to remain the first five point of contact with the communities. And the information that we sent out uh, through the FLWs was to keep the clients or the women on some method during these times, even though that may not be the method of a choice, to ensure continuation and talk to the couple saying that as soon as things ease out, as soon as travel restrictions ease out, as soon as you are more confident to go to a facility, you can get your, say, uh, dose of anthra or get a P IUCD. But in the meantime, make sure that you're using an OCP or a condom so that you remain protected. Uh, we also realized that uh, at during all this time, the need for information remained pretty high, both among the providers and among the clients, and therefore connections maintained using all modes of communication turned to be really, really useful. Uh, there were district WhatsApp groups, there were state WhatsApp groups, there were WhatsApp groups where the frontline workers were all being linked in, there were WhatsApp groups where the RM and CHA counselors and doctors and the ANMs were all already linked in and we started creating, helping the state create a number of audio messages, short case studies, short messages of, you know, positive strokes going out to them saying that we know you're doing a great job, but this also needs to be focused on understanding it through those audio messages that, you know, you're facing difficult and trying times, but you are the warriors and it is you who has to take the uh, SRH services along with uh, you know, the COVID services forward. Uh, the people's need for information remained fairly high and whatever uh, means of uh, communication we could use, we helped the government design a campaign saying Zaruri hai baat karna and you know, really roll that out so that people's need for information around where can they get services, what should be COVID appropriate behavior when they're accessing these services, et cetera, uh, rolled out, endorsed by the government. Uh, we realize that peoples need to connect and understand situations, both COVID and related to SRH services uh, remained pretty high. And therefore we continued, we use the digital means to really get information out. Um, I understand from Rohan that my time is up. Uh, if you could just move to the next few slides, please. Uh, so this is exactly what I have just narrated in terms of the details. Uh, Rohan, move to the next. I'll just conclude in the next 30 seconds. This is again what I've already said. And uh, Aparajita, you did mention uh, our connections or, or you know, the intersectionality or intersectoral convergence that we managed to create. We managed to work with the SRLM to uh, reach uh, information on family planning through the SHG groups. We were able to include FP into the Dastak campaign, campaign of the program. The end result was, if you can move to the next slide, was that 
we were at least able to retain uh, the level of service provisioning through the public health facilities, uh, comparing uh, it to the pre-COVID year of 1920. And uh, the gradual buildup ensured that, uh, of course, a larger basket of spacing methods really moved out. Uh, we made sure that the institutional deliveries that were hap happening, which hadn't dipped during the COVID times, uh, we were able to motivate the providers to counsel for PPIUCD. And as you can see, uh, PPIUCD insertions really show, uh, you know, uh, saw a jump and so did uh, our other uh, spacing methods. So with these efforts, at least uh, what we did try to do was to see that the public sector continue to understand as far as possible the importance of continuing to focus on the RMNCHA uh, SRH set of services along with uh, whatever we were dealing with uh, uh, when it came to the pandemic. And now with the second wave in, I think the work with the government uh, that the support that we are trying to provide is to continue some of these, uh, uh, you know, initiatives that we started and keep the hope alive. So I, I'll, I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti, for also um, sharing with us some positive, whether it was around state response, um, you know, the importance of converging various departments, or even, you know, using digital communications, not just for messaging, but I think a lot of us are also looking at, uh, you know, digital capacity building uh, options that we can utilize in times uh, as as such. Um, and I think it's also really important to learn some of the lessons about what what worked when it was, yes. you know, whether continuing client and uh, FLW interface or it was, you know, when you return to facilities. And I think it's really, really important to build on what we know uh, has worked, uh, you know, in, in the last uh, last year. Um, so with this, uh, thank you to our panelists. And I think I can see uh, four questions. And I am going to start, Shushanto, with you. Uh, we have a question from Priya Nanda, and she's asking, uh, what proportion of women needing first trimester services were seeking them from the facilities? Sushanto? Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Priya, for asking this interesting question. Usually, you know, uh, it is 90 and 10, 90% 90 first trimester and uh, 7 to 10% second trimester at the facility level. But during COVID, this proportion has changed, um, you know, expectedly because, you know, many of the women didn't get service the time they wanted that service. And it was a huge dilemma because of restricted mobility and decision making whether to go or not to go. Therefore, it was a kind of consistent delay of getting ser services. And when they reached from first trimester to second trimester, therefore proportion second trimester requirement has increased in the first four or five months of this pandemic when lockdown was little major. There is another questions on uh, MMA uh, because um, uh, yes. Majority of this, you know, abortions in India happen outside of facilities. Therefore, uh, whether that access or supply of MMA come, you know, it contributed to the compromise abortion. Yes, yes, you are absolutely correct. See, seventy-eight uh, percent of seventy-three percent of our uh, abortions happening outside of facilities uh, through medical abortions. Um, that was pre-COVID situation, but post-COVID, actually, there was huge dilemma of method mix. Surprisingly, public health facility were not having, uh, you know, good proportion providing medical abortion. But we saw in the public health facility suddenly shifted from surgical method to medical abortion because they wanted no touch technology. They didn't want to touch women because they were not having facility to make both sides safe, women as well as you know, mm -hmm. their staff. At the same time, few public facilities really introduce a good practice that how they can channelize that abortion clients to a route where there is no risk of COVID and medical abortion given. But in reality, that 11 million abortions happen in India through medical abortion, for out of facility that was hugely disturbed at the beginning. Because if you go for the gross, you know, MMA availability, it was there. 
but MMA was really having a good pathways from metro cities to urban areas, from urban areas to block headquarters, and it was actually reaching to the rural area. Because of you know lockdown, restriction, administrative blockage, many of you know husbands who actually procured this uh, supply, they couldn't access MMA uh, you know very uh, very nice way and. Uh, whatever supplies was available at the rural area, it is very limited because it is 400 rupees. They do not want to stock always. And that was exhausted. Therefore, there was kind of shortage at the beginning. But from July onwards, it was coming into kind of normalcy. Thank you for asking this interesting question. Thank you, Shishanto. Uh, there is another question for Todd. Uh, which is about uh, were there any state level local solutions actions that were taken to remove these uh, logistic bottlenecks? You spoke about a few, Todd. If you can speak about some more. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, to to be honest, um, most of the negotiating that DKT representatives had to do in the field was with local police. Um, I'm sure that there were initiatives taken taken at the the city, district, or state levels. Uh, uh, that I, I'm not even aware of. Uh, but basically the negotiations that we had were, were with the police uh, or sometimes with uh, city, city councils. And a lot of times uh, what we would do is simply reproduce the uh, Home Affairs Ministry directives and politely make the local police uh, aware uh, of these directives coming from um, you know, the, the central government. And that that usually uh, helped us uh, cut through the problem. But still, in, in a lot of cases, it, 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 it added days to the delivery of uh, orders to our super distributors all around the country. In some frustrating cases, we had shipped orders from the Mumbai area all the way to West Bengal or, or Assam. And we were, we were literally within a few kilometers of being able to deliver the, uh, the orders, but couldn't because of, um, uh, local insistence that uh, that our products uh, were not really essential. So, um, you know, at the beginning of this session, uh, you mentioned having a sense of deja vu. And I must admit, when I listened to some of the local talk shows, uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit disturbed that the word essential isn't being um, spoken about in, in a more careful way. And I'm, and I'm quite worried that that despite everything that has happened over the past year, that we're, we're once again on this dark path and, and we don't know what is gonna be at the end of it. So I worry sometimes that we're gonna to have to have the same debates and fights and battles that we went through uh, a year ago at this time. Maybe I'll stop there. Um, I really hope that we are going, to, we, will, we will be able to make use of some of the lessons learned. Uh, Pranita, if I can come to you now, uh, and this is a big question, Pranita. So I think it's Priya who has asked that given that this wave is much bigger, and this is continuing from what Todd just spoke about, uh, do you think we learned from the last year and set up systems to be more prepared for this wave? Uh, what have been the adaptations in the public and SMO private sector that we can, you know, bank on or will hold well now? So, Pranita. Thank you. Thank you, Prajita. Um, I mean, uh, I, I feel I'm like underprepared to respond to this particular question. Uh, but hearing some of what other panelists said that it seems we did uh, learn some and move in that direction. But uh, I agree with Todd and the point that you mentioned, we have not really been stuck to the essential part of reproductive and sexual health services. So there has been few steps forward, but it's not necessarily complete and comprehensive in that sense. And now that we are in a much bigger crisis, I, I am not sure about whatever initial practices or, or uh, systems that we may have put in place is still working at this point. Uh, not to expect much from the uh, facilities. Uh, probably some of the steps, maybe pharmacies may be taking and supporting uh, 
service delivery, that may be what is happening right now. So that that's my, but this is more of my guesswork, uh, seeing things around and, and hearing from all of you. Thank Todd, you. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, if I may jump in for just a minute. Um, I, I think that uh, broadly speaking, the, um, the the private sector as a whole has 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 taken on board some pretty big lessons. In in my own business, uh, for example, um, we are encouraging our seventy plus super distributors all over the country to build up inventories and keep larger cushions, so that if we do get a two week hard lockdown somewhere, that locally uh, they will already have the products in their warehouse. And locally, they should be able to negotiate uh, 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 the, the, the kind of movement of people um, um, issues so that they can get get products uh, down to the uh, the stockists and the you know the pharmacies and the clinics, the hospitals, uh, et cetera. So one big takeaway is I think that uh, you know not just in our industry but in big pharma across the board. I mean, people are carrying more inventories. Um, you know. Uh, with this second wave, for instance, we are shipping out really large orders this month in anticipation of lockdowns, you know, potentially uh, harder lockdowns in certain parts of the country. So that's one big thing. And what does that mean for, for my relationship with manufacturers? What it means is that, you know, uh, a DKT doesn't own any of the manufacturing assets itself. So we have to plan uh, in advance uh, to, um, to have our IUDs, our condoms, our oral contraceptives, our emergency contraceptive, we we're ordering more of it, and we're you know we're planning more in advance. Um, there's just one more point that uh, Shushanta made about um, MA uh, in the in the two to three months after the big uh, national lockdown was declared last March. I I think that broadly speaking, what he said is true. But I think that that report that um, his organization initially disseminated, there were some errors in it with all due respect. I, I think that lots of chemists, for instance, they do carry several, several shelf boxes of MA pills because it is, a, it is a good seller for them. So my experience was different than that report. We didn't see the, 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 the claimed shortages in the field that that report uh, um, um, telegraphed. Oh, I think, you know, we checked from different organizations and different levels, and they all agreed, yes, we had some downfall. There, because there, three, there, four there. months, actually, really, uh, there was some compromise thing. And, you know, I, over a period of time, we'll be getting this clarity when that unintended pregnancy results will come for, you know, further research and broad research. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Yeah, my, my point let me just finish my point. My point is, yes, there were shortages, but in our in our business and our relationships across the country, uh, at least at DKT, we didn't see it. We didn't see it as as uh, as as much as what was reported. Well, you know, <clears throat> we can't when you talk of shortages and logistic mismanagement, we can't really not look at what's happening now. The shortage of oxygen, of bed, of ventilators. You know, a vaccination. I, I like a very good person. I got myself an appointment. I waited. They first cancelled it. Then I got it again. I went there and I had to wait in a room full of 100 people for three and a half hours before I got my first dose. And this is a high end uh, private facility. And my friends who went to the public sector got it in five minutes. So just kind of, you know. Um, so, yes. So logistics management, I think it's just looking at us right at our face right now. Uh, so, Priti, I have a question for you. Um, so, it, uh, uh, were there similar fa challenges faced in logistics and distribution of non-clinical contraceptives in UP? Uh, how did the convergent and coordination happen on the ground? You talked about, uh, you talked a bit about it. You talked about uh, SRLMs, about the SAG groups. But let's say, you know, did you get to work with PRIs, etc.? And how did the services really reach the people in the last mile, uh, you know, vulnerable groups like migrant women? All right. Yes. So um, thank you for the question, Aparajita. Yes, we did um, face similar situations around uh, transportation and logistics in the initial few months. Uh, that was more because, uh, you know, transport uh, facilities and permissions were just not coming in and 
whether it is uh, the private sector transporting its uh, products to the pharmacies or whether it's the government warehouses transporting uh, you know the supplies to the district hospitals and uh, to the district warehouses private vendors are used uh, so we did face it in the initial couple of months uh, but then around june we were able to figure that out get uh, special permissions for uh, the transporters who were uh, already uh, in a tie up with the government to make sure that the supplies and the products moved but for two months yes uh, we did uh, face that situation uh, and as i did mention when i was presenting that we worked very closely with srlm uh, so that the self help uh, group women became uh, sources of information to the community so whatever material um, ic material audio, audio messages uh, flyers etc that were being pre uh, prepared for uh, the frontline workers of the government were also shared uh, with the shg group so that the frontline workers and they could work together because we realized like i mentioned that the need for information both within the community and among the providers came out as a very huge need especially in situations like this where they couldn't travel uh, to get services they wanted to understand what to do next and uh, you know where to get those services the second thing we managed to do was uh, uh, incorporate family planning information uh, within the dastak campaign which is a government of india uh, campaign uh, where uh, the frontline workers again make house to ho house visit uh, largely to uh, identify uh, you know uh, cases for uh, infectious diseases so platforms like that the uh, hbnc platform was used the vhnd platform was used more strongly to integrate uh, messages there was a convergence at the principal secretary level with the uh principal secretary of the icds very strongly so that the anganwadi workers also carried uh, the information around this and i think the good thing that prompted the state when we were constantly able to highlight to them the need for information was the state taking a call uh, in terms of setting up a state run call center so i think that for me was a big uh, positive because that was something that we had been trying to get the government to focus on for almost the last two to and a half years because when it comes to family planning apt associates as a partner of bmgf was running a care line which was largely focused on anthra but they would also be transitioning out this year so i think covid that way was able to position to the government the need for information and initially what was just a covid call center out of the 60 seats now 15 have been allocated to family planning information so i mean i may sound very optimistic and positive about covid i know there have been repercussions which are far reaching but we continue to want to focus on the positive so that became a very big turning point for the government uh, when it came to migrants of course the frontline workers continued to reach uh, you know the contraceptives through the home delivery of contraceptive scheme and like i mentioned we continue to stress to the frontline workers that leave a contraceptive behind even if the women are saying that this is not their preferred choice leave two packets of condoms behind it's okay even if they throw it away eventually so that was the message that went out and the other thing we did was that all the quarantine centers that had been created for the migrants to who were coming in because there was a large inflow of migrant population we made condoms and oral pills available there through a government order so those were some of the things that the government really proactively took up and did uh, you know all of this happened between april and to june so i think those were some of the steps that the government did take which i'm Thank sure you. helped people uh, yeah. at least be on some contraceptive use some contraceptive um, thank you time. thank you Thank you, Priti. We are down to our last five minutes, so I'm going to just ask one question to our four speakers, and if you can give a thirty-second um, response, and then we can summarize, and we'll still have time uh, for the vote of thanks uh, from the organizers. Uh, so, what main learnings, key takeaway? What's your main recommendation? So we can start with uh, Pranita. Thank you. So my main recommendation is let let's take essential as seriously and operationalize that on ground for coming months and years together thank you thank you todd 
Uh, thank you. I'll keep it short and sweet. Just just battle on. Uh, everybody keep doing what, what you're doing and uh, plan well ahead. Thank you. Shashanta? I think, you know, given this current momentum, I will say challenge is really a big one. We learned a lot, but now thing is that that learning probably will not be able to offset this momentum. We need to reach to the community. Otherwise, it will be very difficult if we think everything will be available at the facility. Sure. Priti? I would just say, let's keep our hope alive. I mean, in the second wave, now that we are working with the government, they are beginning to lose hope. They are beginning to get tired. I think all of us as partners, as, as you know, partners to the government, as NGOs, as, as community-based organizations, I think we have to keep the hope alive. Send out as much positive information as you can. Give positive strokes. And I think that, that, that feeling that we're all in it together. I mean, I see a lot of doctors and nurses talking a language which is almost like we have to deal with it again. And they have to. I mean, the way the patients are coming in. But I think we'll just, my message would be, let's keep the hope alive and let's keep a positive environment and give, give each other positive strokes. And we'll tie through this. And then RM and CHA, SRH, everything will get dealt with. Yeah. No, thank you. I think it's really important, not just for government and NGOs, but also for us as individuals, as family members, uh, to try and, you know, keep, try and find that silver lining in the cloud, that light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I, you guys have done a wonderful job. I don't think I really need to summarize, but as it's my duty as a moderator, I'll just speak for like 30, 40 seconds before I hand it back to the organizers. I think what we heard from you today is both about direct and indirect implementation challenges, uh, you know, where systems response was, you know, in the first phase was more reactive. We are hoping that now with significant learnings, research data, uh, our response now would be more, more uh, you know, better equipped to sustain the services. Uh, I think we all recognize the crisis that our, you know, our frontline workers and our trained providers are facing. Uh, we all recognize how in, inadequate drugs and supplies were major challenges for women in accessing services. And we also, you know, look at how some of the things that work, whether it was, you know, the telemedicine guideline or, you know, what Priti shared with us today, there are, there are things that work and we really need to amplify some of this. I also think that, you know, this whole convergence, uh, you know, I always call it the mystical animal in the room. I think we still have a lot uh, in order to really kind of draw the best out of what intersectoral, interdepartmental convergence can give us. I think convergence with private sector at this point in time is extremely important. And I think uh, at the end of the day, we really, really have to collect all our learnings together and we have to figure out how comprehensively in an integrated manner, how do we really push for, uh, you know, the continuation of essential FPRH services uh, while the country, you know, kind of is facing the second wave. And I think, you know, to end with that, what we heard today uh, was primarily whatever you all told us about was the impact of the first wave of COVID and the impact it had on FPSRH and abortion services. Uh, we all know that the second, this current wave is like a hundred times crueler, a hundred times more destructive. And the number of infections, the loss of life, you know, for me, it's, it's just kind of unimaginable. You know, I, mean, I wouldn't have thought in my wildest dreams that we would have over three lakh new infections every day. Now, hospitals are full, we are running out of beds, oxygen, I mean, crematoriums are overwhelmed, health, health workers are tired. Families are completely broken and devastated. So I think we really, really need to uh, kind of, you know, figure out the best way to emerge from this while really recognizing that the road to recovery this time would really be much, much harder. It'll be much, much tougher. The stress on our, our resources, financial resources, human resources will be much more um, like I said, the light at the end of the tunnel is hard to see, but uh, like Priti said, we must keep up the, the morale, we must find hope uh, wherever we can, and as individuals and organizations do the best that we can. Uh, so with these words, I will hand it back to uh, uh, Bhavita, and thank you speakers, and, and thank you organizers for inviting us. Thank you very much for sharing 
those really important learnings and reflections. Preeti, Pranita, Sushanto, Todd, thank you very much. And Aprajita for bringing it all together so thoughtfully. And I think, like you said, uh, there are really important things for us to keep in mind uh, in what seems to be a harder time ahead. And thank you for inspiring us and leaving us with hope for that and uh, we finished the first week of the conference with this plenary we also have more interesting showcases and panel discussions coming up on thursday and friday next week you can find details on the web platform cornet.in uh, please spread the word we'd love to open these conversations up to more people and of course we'll have recordings of these sessions um, i hope all of you have a safe um, time ahead and a good weekend. Thank you again.